as I stated, the um, title of this presentation is the function of human nutrition. In Dr. Khan's workshop, you learned a lot about different types of food. Uh, Vicki and Michelle showed you how to prepare very delicious food. Um, the function of nutrition, human nutrition is about why we need to eat and why we have to eat. Now there is a nutrition health connection. We're hearing a lot about the center of disease control, right? And according to the center of disease control, the number one cause of chronic disease is poor diet and most chronic diseases can be prevented. The CDC is our nation's disease surveillance, surveillance and health promotion agency. Um, we're getting a lot of information from the CDC about the COVID-19 virus. You know, that is their, you know, that is their role, is to um, make sure that their radar is up so that we know exactly what is going on with the health status of people in the United States, as well as to uh, advise them of any threats and then put strategies in place to protect us and reverse them. The CDC collects, tracks, analyzes, and reports health statistics and trends. That means that every time you go to the doctor, that information ultimately ends up in a database. So they know the average weight of Americans by population, um, disease entities, know your specific name is not there, but the data is there so that they can track and do analysis and make put strategies in place. Okay, as a nation's health protection agency, CDC saves lives and protects people from health threats. That's why most of us are at home. That's why we're required to wear a mask and gloves. That's why um, we are required to stay uh, six feet away from others. CDC's nutrition efforts support public health strategies and programs that improve dietary quality, support healthy child development, and reduce chronic disease. Now, right now, with regard to COVID-19, we're in a situation where we're kind of building a house in the middle of a storm because they don't completely understand it. And there are a lot of resources devoted to it all over the world. You got public health officials, epidemiologists, doctors, scientists, all working on this 24 seven. But with regards to chronic disease, we have for quite some time known a lot. Now, what is COVID-19? COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2. Uh, older adults and people who have severe underlying medical conditions like heart or lung disease or diabetes seem to be at a higher risk for developing more serious complications from COVID-19 illness. Now, we know that there are some individuals, just think of the range of this disease and how it affects people. Some may have it and have no symptoms at all and can pass it on to somebody else. Some can have it and they have uh, symptoms, but they can self-quarantine at home and the, the disease resolves. Some end up in the hospital and um, maybe they'll get oxygen and after a period of time, they get their, the disease resolves and they go home. And then some end up on a ventilator. Unfortunately, those who end up on the ventilator, they say that about 85 to 86% of those individuals pass away. So we, what we know about COVID-19 at this point is a highly contagious infectious disease. Today, there is no vaccine and no standard treatment for it. Standard medical treatments exist for chronic diseases for disease maintenance. Chronic diseases are most often lifestyle induced with poor diet being the number one factor and chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases proven to be prevented and reversed. So that's gonna be our focus uh, tonight. About chronic diseases. Chronic diseases are defined broadly as conditions that last one year or more and require ongoing medical attention or limit activities of daily living or both. Six in 10 Americans, which means about, about six in 10 Americans, which means 60% live with at least one chronic disease and four out of 10 have two or more, which means 40% have 
two or more, like heart disease and stroke, cancer or diabetes. These and other chronic diseases are the leading causes of death and disability in America. And they are also a leading driver of healthcare costs. According to the CDC, most chronic diseases can be prevented by eating well, being physically active, avoiding tobacco and excessive drinking. And when they say according to the CDC, it says they have evidence, research that proves that chronic diseases can be prevented by eating well, being, being physically active, avoiding tobacco and excessive drinking. So um, it, it is, it is science-based. Okay, why nutrition knowledge is essential. I like this quote from Dr. Miles Monroe. He says, when the purpose of a thing is unknown, abuse is inevitable. Most of us learn how to eat from our parents, grandparents, family members, friends of family. And we can think that we're eating well, but we may not be. So it is very, very important to have knowledge about it. You know, there happens to be a scripture in the Bible that says um, the lack of knowledge really causes individuals to be harmed or destroyed. Okay, so let's begin to talk about the function of human nutrition. Let's start off with a de definition first. The function is the purpose for which something is designed or exists. So the fact that we have to eat, it has a specific purpose. It's a thing dependent on another factor or other factors, which means that our health is dependent upon other factors. And it's a practical, practical use or, or purpose in design. Now, why we must eat? Okay, nutrition is the consumption of food that maintains and promotes the healthy function of the human body. Notice the word healthy. That's why we're supposed to eat, is to be able to maintain our body in a state of health and to energize our body. Now, what is food? Food is the material that people and animals eat, material containing carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and supplements that is taken in by and used in the living body for growth and repair and as a source of energy for activities. Our bodies are constantly producing new cells. Cells are dying every day. It's a, poor, it's, a, it's a part of the natural human process. But the food and the nutrition are building blocks of those new cells. Now, we have a whole system devoted to the processing of food. It is referred to as the digestive system. The specialty that's devoted to it is the GI, uh, gastroenterologist. We often refer to them as GI doctors. Now, digestion is the breakdown of large insoluble food molecules into small water food molecules, small water soluble food molecule, molecules, so that they can be absorbed into the watery blood plasma. Now, keep that in mind as we go on in this presentation, so that they can be absorbed in the watery blood plasma. In chemical digestion, enzymes break down food into the small molecules the body can use. Now go back up to the beginning of the definition again. It's a digestion is the breakdown of large inside the food molecules. Now sometimes we might put something in our mouth and we just swallow it. We should always chew it because the body looks at it as a large inside of food, even if it's a small peanut, because we need to, um, to chew it so that it ultimately can be absorbed. Now, the digestive system function summary, there are, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, what? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Um, parts of the digestive system. There's a salivary glands, which secretes saliva. So as soon as you put something in your mouth and you start to chew, then saliva generates. Then there's the pharynx that sends the food to the esophagus and then the esophagus sends the food to the stomach and the stomach actually digests the food. It's a chemical reaction, okay? So it begins to break down the food so it can go into the small intestine. And within the small intestines, that's where we absorb our nutrients. And then in the large intestines, the waste is formed. That's why it's so important to, to um, eat food that is high in fiber. 
also plant-based food has water in it. And then it goes to the rectum where it stores it for the elimination of weight. When it says store, just for a brief period of time because it needs to be eliminated. Now the correlation between causes of death and actual causes of death. Now this chart that I'm getting ready to show you is old, right? The CDC uh, produced it in 2000. They haven't produced it again. I've called them, they just haven't done it. I took it out one time, but I saw another doctor use it, it still uses it just for you to see the correlation because the correlation still exists. Meaning there are leading causes of death, meaning what goes on the death certificate, heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic, low terror, respiratory diseases, but the actual cause of disease and, and um, maybe tobacco or poor diet, physical inactivity, alcohol consumption. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, and a lot of chronic diseases have some underlying causes and factors. That's, I want you to see the causative, causative factor here, okay? Okay, chronic disease risk factors. Tobacco use and exposure to secondhand smoke. Also, we should make note of thirdhand smoke. Thirdhand smoke is smoke that gets in materials. It gets in the carpet, or if you go to rent a car and you smell it, or it gets in your clothes. Now, tobacco use is down significantly, but we're running into another problem where we're finding particularly young people are doing um, vaping about Three months ago, there was a teenager that had both lungs replaced because of vaping at Henry Ford Hospital. Poor nutrition, including diets low in fruits and vegetables and high in sodium and saturated fats, lack of physical activity, excessive alcohol use. The purpose of nutrition. Okay, we're gonna look at three definitions of nutrition. The process of nourishing or being nourished, especially the process by which a living organism assimilates food and uses it for growth, repair, and replacement of tissues. Now, food can taste good. It's supposed to taste good. It should be yummy, but it also should meet these requirements that it it, it for growth, repair, and replacement of tissue. Okay, a second definition, a process or series of processes by which the living organism or its component parts or organs is maintained in its normal condition of life and growth. You know, when you go to the doctor and you get your test results back, they will determine as to whether it was positive or negative or they say it was normal or abnormal. Well, the food that we eat is supposed to maintain us in a state of normalcy, which is considered a state of being healthy. The third definition is the process by which the living tissue take up from the blood nutritive matters necessary for the repair and the performance of their healthy functions. So food should keep us healthy. Now also notice this as a process by which the living tissue take up from the blood. Now, you know, the blood goes throughout the entire body. So whatever we eat is going to, all, it's all cells in our body are going to be um, nourished by it. That's just at the top and it's kind of, there it is. Okay, the human body's nutritional requirements. Water, nine caloric substance composed of hydrogen and oxygen vital to all forms of life. And when I'm referring to water, I'm referring to two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. It is fine to put uh, lemon in your water, strawberries in your water, but I see people opening little packets of things and putting in the water and it has a lot of uh, chemicals, dyes, and sugar in it. Um, so be careful about that. Macronutrients, which are protein, carbohydrates, and fats, Macronutrients, protein, cobalt, have fats is that where we get our calories from. And then tr micronutrients, trace elements such as vitamins and minerals, they differ from macronutrients because they are necessary only in very, very small amounts. You'll find macronutrients primarily in um, plant food. Now, the standard American diet, for the most part, is high in fat and high in cholesterol. Uh, we really don't need to eat food with cholesterol in it because our body makes our own cholesterol. That's one of the reasons why we have excessive cholesterol rates is because we're eating it when the body makes it. 
Okay, fast food. Um, fast food, do we really know what's in it? You ever get some pota pot potatoes from a fast food restaurant? I'm trying my best not to mention um, one by name. I don't want to get in trouble like uh, Oprah Winfrey did. Um, and you look at those potatoes and they're white. Okay, you see them put them in that basket. Now, I cook potatoes. If I cut that potato and I go away for 10 or 15 minutes, when I come back, it's not white. You know, it's turned a little bit, right? So they've obviously put something on those potatoes to keep them white like that. Hormone injected foods, which are primarily put in meats to be able to grow them faster or grow them bigger. So which means that if you're eating meats that have been injected with hormones, guess what? Those hormones are also getting in your body. There is a theory, um, there might even be some research, I haven't seen it, I've just heard it said, that one of the reasons why young females are developing so early is because of the hormones that are in the meat. Adulterated or chemical additives, just adding things uh, to food that are really not healthy. Foods that are highly processed, if you think about um, white bread, you know, there was a bread that used to be called Wonder Bread that would build bodies 12 ways. I don't think so, you know? If you ball it up, it was almost like chewing gum. Um, denatured food, where they actually strip food of its nutritional value, where you take the, um, take the brand, you take the nutrients off of it for shelf life. And refined sugars and artificial sweeteners. Um, if you've ever seen sugar cane, sugar cane is more of a caramel color or a brown color. It is not white, but yet if you open up a, a bag of sugar, it pours out and it's white, and that's because it's been processed. Now, all of us know the first time we ever go to the dentist, they tell us, watch out for candy, meaning watch out for sugar. Now, our teeth, the dentition in your teeth is the hardest substance in your body, and it can break that substance down. Now, I just want to give you something that's food for thought. Our teeth are part of our skeletal system. Now, it's been known that in the United States, we have higher rates of osteoporosis than some countries where they are primarily on a plant-based diet. It is being considered that one of the reasons is because eating a lot of sugar is leaching a lot of the nutrients out of the bones because it is part of the skeletal system. Intoxicating substance such as tobacco and alcohol. Top 10 chronic disease. Cardiovascular disease, also sometimes referred to as heart disease smoking related health issues, alcohol related health issues, diabetes, Alzheimer's. By the way, Alzheimer's is, is being looked at as to whether it is diabetes three. Now that's research that's being devoted to that right now. It is not conclusive, but one of the things that they're beginning to notice is that individuals with diabetes seem to be more susceptible to Alzheimer's. And they're wondering if that, that high level of glucose flowing around in the body is also affecting the brain. Um, there are some doctors who are doing some research on, matter of fact, they've done some incredible research. I have the book right here. I highly recommend that you get the Alzheimer's um, Solution by Dean and Aisha Shirazi. This is, it's, it's absolutely positively excellent. Uh, cancer, which there are all different types of cancer, obesity, arthritis, which arthritis is a autoimmune disease, um, asthma, and stroke. Okay, leading causes of death. Okay, it's heart disease, cancer, accidents, unintentional injuries, chronic lower respiratory diseases, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, influenza, pneumonia, nephritis, which is kidney disease, inintentional self-harm, uh, suicide, which unfortunately is on the rise. Um, mental health issues are on the rise. Um, there's research out there saying that there's also connection between mental health and diet. Actual causes of preventable deaths in the United States, that's just a different type of table where we want to see where poor diet actually is pretty high on that table. Now, before we go on, let's talk about genetics versus epigenetics just for a second, because there are a lot of us that are on the impression I was at one time, you know, it's just in my genetic pool. 
there's absolutely positively nothing I can do about that. Not so. They said that there are commanding genes and there are committee genes. They said commanding genes say your eyes are going to be brown or you're going to have a certain texture of hair or you're going to be a certain height. Committee genes are genes that are influenced by our lifestyle. That body of study is called epigenetics. Epigenetics involves genetic control by factors other than the individual's DNA sequence. When I read about that, I mean, I was so excited because that goes to show that I really do have a lot of power over my health status. Epigenetic changes can switch genes on or off. You believe that? And determine which proteins are transcribed. Now, if you look in Dr. Uh, T. Colin Campbell's book, the, the China Study, he did some research where he actually turned cancer genes on and off in a petri dish. If you hadn't read that book, I highly recommend that you do. So this, this, you are what you eat then. So we looked at the three definitions, right? I'm just going to go to the third one again. The process by which the living tissue can take up from the blood, I want you to pay attention, from the blood, nutritive matters necessary for the repair and the performance of their healthy functions. That's why we have to eat. Nutrients are necessary for the repair and, and performance of their healthy functions. All of us know that there's such a thing as called um, uh, starvation. I'm not talking about somebody's malnourished, malnourished where they're not, they're eating and they're not getting nutrients. If you don't eat at all, eventually it will result, it, uh, result in death. We'll take you know, a little bit of time, but we can't live without eating. Okay, so this is why we are what we eat. First of all, we have a body, right? Then we have body systems. You have the reproductive system, you have the neurological system, cardiovascular uh, system, so on and so forth. Each body system has organs. Every organ is associated with a particular body system. Organs are made up out of tissues. Tissues are made up out of cells. That's why if a doctor is concerned about an organ in an individual's body, they'll say, we're going to do a biopsy. And what a biopsy is, is then they go in and they snip a piece of tissue from that organ, put it under a microscope or any other type of studies that they do, and they look at the cells to see what the cells are doing. Now, with regards to cancer, I like to refer to it when um, that means that those cells are going renegade. They're not doing what it is that they're supposed to do. And then blood is a combination of cells and plasma. Now, this is why I say we are what we eat. First of all, there's food, right? The nutritive matter in the food is taken up by the blood, right? That blood is that watery plasma you got cells in there and you got the watery plasma right so then so then you have the cells the cells make up tissue tissues make up organs organs make up systems systems can make up the body that's why you can go to the doctor you get a blood test they're testing your glucose level your a1c and they make a determination that you may have diabetes. And given the fact that the CDC and other researchers have determined di that diabetes is primarily lifestyle induced, meaning diet came from the food. So what's so amazing about this is that our part is to give the body the food that promotes health, that will grow healthy cells and replace cells. So Nutrition to, is to function the human body must have, must have. There's nothing we could do about that. The human body must have nutrients. The nutrients known to be essential for human beings are proteins, carbohydrates, fats and oils, minerals, vitamins, and water. Now, you know, we were chit-chatting a little bit before we actually got started. And I've been looking out of my window a lot, probably most of us have, because we haven't been able to go out as much. And I've been watching the animals come out. And the animals are coming out because it's quiet and it's more like a natural habitat. And I thought about this. Within a matter of about a month, six weeks, eight weeks, 
that we're beginning to see um, bodies of water clear up, air quality is better, and we're a part of nature. So, you know, when we can make some changes, it's amazing how nature can change things and heal. And that same thing exists for us, and it's been proven um, when individuals go on a whole food plant-based diet. Now I wanna talk about metabolism for a second. Now, most of the time when we talk about metabolism, people say, oh, somebody has a real high metabolism so they can eat as much as they want and they never gain weight. Or somebody has a sluggish metabolism and they don't eat very much and they, and they gain a lot of weight. That's not the angle that I wanna come from. The angle that I wanna come from is the act or process by which living tissue or cells take up their own proper substance the nutritive material brought to them again by the blood or by which they transform their cell protoplasm into simple substances which are filled for either excretion or for some special purpose. That means the food that we eat should be also doing two things. Number one, nourishing us, giving the body the nutrients it needs for growth, repair, and replacement of tissue. Also, the spot somehow is supposed to be excreted. That's why we have bowel movements. That's why we urinate. That's why we have, uh, uh, we, that we perspire. Plant-based foods have water in them and they have fiber in them to help move it through the body. One of the biggest problems that we have in this country, I wouldn't doubt if it's other parts of the country too, is constipation. Now, you know, when you are ever constipated, you don't feel very well. You can feel nauseous. You can get a headache. You can get uh, rashes. You could actually sometimes start to shake because that is waste that's supposed to be eliminated for the body, supposed to be excreted. If you're on a diet that is high in um, animal products that don't have any fiber in it, then you are devoid of an element that will help move the um, waste through the body. Okay, so why we must eat? Nutrition is the consumption of food that maintains and promotes the healthy function of the human body. Food is the material that people and animals eat that is taken in by and used in the living body for growth and repair and as a source of energy for activities. I know that this slide, um, was looked at previously, but I just want to emphasize that because the goal of this particular workshop today is to give everybody an understanding of the function of nutrition and the foods that we need to eat to keep the body in a healthy state. The healthy, healthy promote, health promoting foods are whole plant based foods. Um, I like to say to it, it's food that is either picked from a tree pulled out of the ground or plucked off of a vine. It's food that comes in its natural state from nature, like whole grains, ground rice, millet, quinoa, beans and legumes, lentils, kidney beans, lima beans, black beans, navy beans, hopefully to replace those other foods that not doing so well in the, uh, Hopefully people will begin to eat more of those as opposed to eating meat. Um, bean products, there are certain things that are made from beans. Um, tofu and tempeh are made from soybeans. Um, uh, tempeh is a fermented food. Most of us are, are familiar with uh, tofu. There's some individuals that are concerned about soy as to whether there's so much estrogen in it. Um, I heard a seminar yesterday and said that that is really a healthy form of, of estrogen and we don't need really need to be concerned about it. However, if it's your choice to eat beans a different way, there's so many other beans to eat that I don't think you have to really worry about that. If you choose fresh vegetables, do they have to be fresh? No, I just happen to buy it. I happen to be a little bit biased. So I usually just eat fresh vegetables, but there are many packaged uh, vegetables out there that are organic. Um, it is highly recommend I, that you eat root vegetables, green leafy vegetables and round vegetables. Root vegetables are vegetables that grow down in the ground like carrots, onions, uh, turnips, anything that you gotta pull out of the ground. Green leafy vegetables are vegetables like kale, mustard greens, collard greens, 
uh, turnip greens, uh, arugula that are so rich in um, uh, uh, phytonutrients and um, in, 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 uh, in, in, in other vitamins. Uh, round vegetables or vegetables that are round that lay on the ground like, uh, you know, like squash. Because you want to get variety in your diet. Fresh fruits, do they all have to be fresh? Well, you know, our people are making fruit smoothies and, you know, they keep, you know, frozen bags of vegetables in their freezer. There's nothing wrong with that. But of course, it's really a good idea to eat fresh fruits, you know, particularly, um, you know, berries, nuts and seeds. Now, when you eat nuts and seeds, you want to eat them in small amounts because uh, nuts have a lot of natural oil in them. And you don't want to eat them with a lot of salt on them, and you don't want to eat them if they want to be if they're cooked in oil. Roasted brings out the oil a little bit, or also you can eat them raw. Sea vegetables. I don't know how many of you are familiar with sea vegetables. Sea vegetables have a lot of minerals in them. If you go to the sushi bar, you know that this dark green wrapping is around the, the sushi. I eat the, the vegetarian sushi. They refer to as nori, the name of it is nori, and um, sea vegetables have a lot of minerals in them. There are other types of sea vegetables. There's kombu, which I usually um, put in my soups and stews because it adds nutrients. It doesn't have any flavor. Um, I put it in a lot of my food and I call it my vegetarian fat back. You know, when I was growing up, <laughs> my grandmother used to put fat back in certain types of foods. It was this big, thick piece of pork, I think it is but I put a combo in there. There's arame, there's hijiki, there's dos. You know, dos is very um, easy to get in your body. You can get the dos and put it, crush it up and put it in your salad. You don't even taste it. Now, hijiki and arame have very strong taste. So it may be a required taste, but kombu, if you put it in your soups, um, once it, it gets soft to chop it up and put it in there, you won't notice the, uh, any change in taste. So what to do? Know that you are a key determiner of your health status. Gain nutritional knowledge. Know that you are, know what you are eating. Know the ingredients of your food. Choose to eat health promoting foods which energizes and provides essential nutrients for your body and strengthens immunity. Now, all of us, if we've been watching TV and it's hard not to, we're hearing that individuals with underlying chronic diseases seem to be at risk for poor outcomes from recovering from COVID-19. Fortunately, one of the things that PBNSG is doing and also other doctors, are we are supporting medical schools in integrating nutrition into uh, medical education, most doctors have had absolutely positively no education in nutrition. However, Thomas Edison projected that one day the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patient in the care of the human frame and diet and in the cause and prevention of disease. I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where there'll be no medicine, but as stated in the Hippocratic Oath, and if you look at the Hippocratic Oath, the first thing that they look at is dietary measures. Well, Sir Winston Churchill said, healthy citizens are the greatest asset any country can have. And that's playing itself out now because the economic crisis that we're in is caused by this public health crisis. You are of great value. I believe that the greatest gift you can give your family and the world is a healthy you. That is a quote from Joyce Myers. We can open up now um, for any questions. Boy, I did good, Lisa. It's 745 on the nose. <laughs> you nailed it. You did a phenomenal job, Sharon, of explaining that on a very easy to understand way. Um, I actually want to piggyback off of something you said in the very beginning when you talked about um, digestion. I think that's one of the things uh, people miss in adopting a healthier lifestyle is that we live not on what we eat, but on what we digest, right? And mm -hmm. so you could eat 
as healthy as you want. But if for, if for some reason, the food that you're consuming is not bioavailable to your body because of prescription drugs, because of, because of pre-existing uh, conditions, digestive issues, you will be stumped think, trying to figure out why I'm eating right. Why am I still nutritionally deficient? Why do mm -hmm. I not feel good, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and a real world example of that, for example, is um, you know, acid reflux. The, the drug mm -hmm. that's prescribed for acid reflux um, works pre uh, prevacid, pro what is it called? I forget the prescription name of it. Somebody help mm -hmm. me out. But it works so well that it completely uh, numbs all the acid that's in our belly so that our body can't mm -hmm. break down our food. So a lot of times we'll have acid reflux and we'll be on the drug Prilosec. That's it, Prilosec. Prilosec. But we're, uh, no matter how many vegetables and things we eat, we can't absorb it. So I think it's really important. That digestion part really stood out to me personally. Um, I thought that was really important. Um, one, can I, can I piggyback on that, Lisa? Yeah. Yep. One other thing that you can help to aid yourself in digestion is to chew your food thoroughly. Yes. You know, when we talked about the digestive system, it said that the body notices everything that we put in our mouth as large and insoluble. And the way to make it soluble so that the body can use it for the growth, repair, and replacement of tissues is to chew it. Mm hmm that's exactly right. And then um, we have a couple questions here that popped up, Sharon. Someone said, for individuals on medications that cause constipation, what are good foods to add to the diet to help counter this? One of the things that you can add to your diet, well, first of all, I'm, I'm going I'm to reemphasize chewing again, because sometimes we don't, we don't chew, what, you know, chew well enough. Put the you know, food in your mouth, put the fork down and chew it. Are you yeah. drinking an adequate amount of water? Yep. And also that you can add flaxseed to your to your diet. You can add one to two tablespoons full. I usually put one tablespoon in my um, my oatmeal or whatever my morning porridge. And if you're making smoothies, by all means, add some flaxseed. You have anything to add, Lisa? No, I think that especially that water piece is really good. I don't think people um, sometimes comprehend how beneficial water is to getting our bowels moving and cycling those toxins out, you know, through our body, through our liver. Um, so the hydration, I agree a thousand percent. The chewing, I agree a thousand percent as well is really important. Um, and like you said, flax seeds and high fiber, you know, a minimum of 30 grams a day or more. Really important. Somebody said, so smoothies are bad because we are not chewing. No. That's not true. No. You just don't want to liquefy all of your fruits. You have to chew mm -hmm. to create that nitric oxide, but mm -hmm. you don't have to, you, you don't have to get rid of the smoothies or juices. They can be beneficial. There's a place for them, yes. but I would not recommend that be your only daily source of vegetables or fruit. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, you know, if uh, someone who uh, taught me early when I started this journey over 30 years ago, they said, think about nature. He said, do you think you have those teeth just to smile at people? <laughs> they said they're there for a reason. Just stop and think about it. When a baby starts to get teeth, they start to chew and they don't want to just suck anymore. They want something, something to chew on. Yeah. So it's just a na it's, it's, it's an innate natural function to put something in your mouth and to chew it. So also make sure that you're, you know, you're chewing your food very well. Yeah, I agree. I, I heard somebody say one time, you know, our teeth are just the bones we can see. And I was like, yeah. that's so true. <laughs> that's so true. Anyway, yeah. okay. <laughs> a couple more questions here. Let's see. Um, is there a, re a relation between nutrition and inflammation? Susan asked. A hundred percent there is. Uh, you got something you want to say first, Sharon? Yes, there are some foods that are considered um, uh, foods that cause in in inflammation. Number one on the list are animal foods, particularly meat. Also, sugar can, you know, cause, you know, a lot of inflammation in the body. Now, when you have inflammation in the body, that could lead to disease. Now, inflammation in some ways is our friend. Say, for instance, um, you cut yourself, burn yourself, uh, you know, you got a temperature. Well, the body uh, generates the inflammation just for a healing process, right? Mm -hmm. But if it stays that way, then the body is constantly in a state of emergency. 
Yeah. And it's not supposed to stay in a certain emergency because if it stays in a state of emergency, then it becomes very, very harmful. So that mechanism is there. That's nature's way of healing and protecting us. But we should not be in that state long term because being in that state long term causes damage to the body. Absolutely. Yeah, Susan, inflammation is meant to be acute, not chronic. Um, like Sharon said, it's just a signal to your body that something needs to be addressed. But many foods are inflammatory, such as the sugar, the meat, dairy, highly inflammatory. And um, a lot uh, most processed foods are highly inflammatory. So huge, huge correlation. Um, combo can you be- You know, Lisa, you, I want to make one, one comment about uh, dairy, dairy foods. You know that they said the COVID virus attacks the respiratory, system, particularly the lungs. Foods like yogurt, ice cream, they create a lot of mucus in the lung. Yes. In fact, when I changed my diet over 30 years ago, I was eating a pint of ice cream mm. every day. Mm. And when I went to the individual, you know, as I've her name was Dr. Jewel Pukram, and then she took me to someone by the name also Michael Rossoff. I had I, I was experiencing hay fever, and he said that's because your lungs is full of mucus. Wow. And I said no, it's because of the pollen. He said no. He said pollen is a part of nature, and it's doing what it's supposed to do. But because you have all this mucus in your lungs, the mucus gets trapped and it's irritating. So your eyes are running, your nose are running. He said in addition to that, all that saturated fat. Mm is getting in other areas of your body, like your arteries, like your uterus, like your breast. Mm. He says, so I recommend that you cease and desist with that as soon as you can. Mm. Do you know that once I stopped consuming dairy foods after a period of time, I have no longer had an experience with hay fever. Mm. Never happened again. Mm. So one of the ways in which we can protect our lungs is to get the dairy food out of our diets. Yes. Agreed, a thousand percent. Uh, dairy is one of the worst things you can put in your body a hundred percent. There's no room for moderation. Any of it is horrible. And that- yeah. You know, yeah. ice cream is hard, cold, fat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> State your case against ice cream, Sharon. That's right. <laughs> uh, hard, cold, fat. I got hard, it. Hard, cold, <laughs> fat. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree a thousand percent. It's horrible. And then, you know, full of sugar, it's a, just an inflammation bomb, really. Mm -hmm. um okay let's see uh oh, robin's was just a comment kombu can be used to cook beans it helps to soften and reduce gas cook without salt first use seasonings then soft when soft add salt to taste thank you for that comment robin yep. luann um we talked about smoothies okay um can good nutrition weaken a virus in your system like COVID 19 uh, and i missed one about epigenetics i'm gonna come back linda um Yes, can good nutrition weaken a virus in your system? So, I, I, so once a virus enters your system, it, it essentially has to run its course. But how do we stop it in its tracks from pretty much duplicating itself? Because a virus, unlike bacteria, a virus can't live outside your body, right? It needs a host in order to make copies of itself, right? Um, and so good, what good nutrition does primarily is assist your body in creating those antibodies required to fight it off, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the best way to use nutrition to do this, obviously, is before something has attacked, right? And so the, the nutrition is going to be the most powerful in fighting a virus before you have the virus, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, one specific antibody that fights viruses on our mucosal surfaces, which is our eyes, our nose, and our mouth, is called IgA, immunoglobulin type A. And so the mucus that's on our eyes, our nose, and our mouth has this particular antibody that once the virus gets in a body in one of those three places, it, it latches on there. But if you have enough IgA, which is boosted by good nutrition and exercise, then it can fight it off and prevent it from attacking you in the first place. So, but absolutely. Now, one of the things that breaks up mucus in your body, Glory, is um, hot liquids. So one of the things I've been recommending in all of my nutrition lectures is that you make you're making sure you're drinking half your body weight in ounces of water per day, in addition to some hot liquid every day, like um, hot water or, or hot tea, uh, uh, herbal tea. But not, I'm not counting coffee, for example, because that's an any a, a diuretic. It can be inflammatory depending on what you're adding to it. But some uh, a hot 
liquid every day is going to help begin to break up some of the mucus if you already even have a virus right not just COVID just any virus mm -hmm. everything that we said tonight is not just COVID it's just period mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um so keep that in mind as well um, and I'm going to add a couple other things to the list of breaking up that mucus and body um radishes mm. you know radishes and also uh Lisa said hot liquid add some ginger mm -hmm. to that hot liquid and there's another tea that you can get. Um, um, I haven't seen the health food stores, but if you go on Amazon, you can get it. It's called Hatomugi barley tea. It's roasted barley. You don't have to type to that in the chat, Sharon. Oh, type that in the chat. Okay. We ain't, we ain't got that. Yeah. How, how, what, is, that. Okay. what is it called? <laughs> I'll put that in the chat. Please. And then also one other thing about the um, your immune system. It is your body's military. And you know, maybe we can get in a, another one of these at some time when we could talk about the immune system. Immune system literally, when it finds itself to be compromised, it can call for backup. What, you know, there, there's the acquired immunity, there's the innate immunity. You know, the innate immunity is what we're born with. Then there's the acquired immunity that is affected by our lifestyle. Yeah. But it literally can, can, it's a very, very, complicated sophisticated system but it literally can call for backup when it finds itself to 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 be to be weakened and a whole food plant-based diet has been shown to really support the immunity of the body absolutely okay a couple more don't forget to type that t down there sharon okay. um a couple more questions here as we begin to wrap up uh glenda said can you share a bit more about epigenetics switching genes on and off. Are you suggesting that changing our diet may switch off certain genes that may lead to disease? A hundred percent, that's exactly what we're yeah. saying. So you yeah. do have the potential. When we eat uh, sugar, refined foods, dairy, um, drink excess alcohol, smoke tobacco, even when we have high amounts of stress, negative thoughts, negative emotions, depression, anxiety, all of those things, they upregulate the genes for disease. Okay, and when we do the opposite of all of that thing, all of those things, they downregulate uh, the, those those markers for disease. So it is absolutely possible. Epigenetic modification, like Sharon mentioned, is all about um, changing the potential of of your lineage through behavior modification, as opposed to an actual change in your DNA. Right. And so your behaviors every day can literally determine the diseases or lack thereof that will exist in future generations of your heritage. Does that make sense? I lost yeah. your picture. I saw, okay, there you are. Okay, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Okay. And then I know you're in front of the table, right? So I see you Monday night. You're right. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So next question. Um, I'm going to skip past the comments, guys. Does drinking a fruit and veggie smoothie count as chewing? Is this cheating the system? No, you, you need to chew. Drinking, once it's liquefied, the best liquefiers are going to be your teeth. So there's nothing wrong with liquefying them in a machine like a blender. Um, but it, chewing trumps liquefying every single time. Because when you chew with your teeth, you the the, the like you talk about the salivary glands, the sal saliva on your tongue, and then somebody mentioned in here too, chewing gets your stomach ready for food. There's that part, um, but also when that food mixes on with your saliva, we begin to set the stage to create that nitric oxide, which is going to protect your arterial wall. Um, and so chewing has way more benefits than pre liquefying your food. Okay um let's see anything else here sharon what's the recommended water to drink half your body weight in ounces per day take mm -hmm. your weight divide it by two and that's the minimum we understand mm -hmm. that some people have pre-existing conditions fluid retention that's a different set conversation but in general half your body weight in ounces per day okay um Boom, boom, boom. I have read that dairy is a huge comp contributor, cause of acne. Yes, not only is dairy one of the leading cause of acne, it's also one of the leading causes of early hair loss, okay? Mm -hmm. So balding, right? Uh, dairy, dairy, dairy for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, are you really nutrient deficient if you have celiac related sensitivities to things like barley, rye, wheat, and some beans like fava and lima beans? Uh, no, I would, new, that just means you have food sensitivity to uh, the gluten, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have nutritional deficiencies. You can potentially get the 102 vitamins and minerals you need to thrive from other foods. So I wouldn't necessarily say celiac 
having celiac means nutritional deficiencies unless you're constantly eating the things that flares up the celiac and can pre prevent you from properly digesting or being able to eat anything else as you're going through a flare up from the celiac. What, you want to piggyback on that, Sharon, or you're good? I'm good. You're good. Yep. <laughs> you're good. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Um, how much hot liquid per day? I personally just do um, one cup. It's usually, uh, I don't know where my teacup is, uh, maybe about 10 to 12 ounces. I do one cup of herbal tea per day uh, at minimum, sometimes two. Um, and again, you could just boil water and like Sharon said, add some ginger in there, add some lemon in there add some raw honey in there if you like if you know unless you're doing completely vegan then no honey okay mm -hmm. um i hear often recommendations to blenderize fruits and vegetables my physician advised never to do that as it changes the chemical structures of the fruits thereby increasing the sugar content which is in contradiction in pre-metabolic syndromes and diabetes yeah so one of the the formula that i personally give for clients and students who are blending is that um, you want 75% plants and one to two fruits. As, as Dr. Brooke Goldner always liked to say, you're only adding the fruit to wash the medicine down, i.e. Mm -hmm. the plants, right? And so mm -hmm. a lot of times we want all of the fruit because it's more palatable and we, we love sweetness, right? But mm -hmm. I highly recommend loading that thing up with the plants um, and any like your nuts, your seeds, your whatever else is going to go in there. Um, and I personally, like I made a smoothie today, it was 75% kale, a quarter of a lemon, because vitamin C helps you absorb all the other nutrients better. So I always add a squeeze a lemon or a quarter of a lemon in the smoothie for that extra vitamin C on those greens. Um, and then I had frozen raspberries and fresh mango. Um, and then I add chia seeds after I blend it. I never blend my chia. I just stir it in. Mm -hmm. And, and I had oat milk as my liquid. And it was only two ingredients in my oat milk, which was water and oats, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was a smoothie that I had today. It's not the only vegetable though, right? Mm -hmm. I also chewed some green beans today. I chewed some other plants today. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, it, blender, blending it does change the metabolic structure, but whether or not it's going to be converted to too much sugar depends on how much sugar you start with, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, and, and then in the, in the, uh, the you know the green vegetables are more nutrient rich than the fruits you know they have exactly. yeah far more nutrient not to say that fruits don't have them but uh, the green leafy vegetables are more more power packed when it comes to nutrients yes okay any final questions or comments wonderful people why do you not blend chia seeds it's not necessary um, they are already they never really blend obviously they, I mean they're so tiny. So I just stir them into my drink or, you know, sprinkle them or on some oatmeal or a salad. Um, once they get wet, once chia seeds get wet, they form a gel-like consistency, which binds to hard to move toxins in your body and pushes those hard to move toxins to that lower intestine and out your body. So chia seeds are great for getting rid of hard to move toxins, but there's no need to blend them because you can just stir them in and they still go beautifully through a straw and everything like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that's all we have. Everybody's like, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. It's been our pleasure. Yeah. And before we close out, you know, strong health also includes having having more energy. Yes. You know, being able to sleep, it's being able to sleep better. You, you know, you're more vibrant. You're more, you, you know, you're more vital. I mean, there's so many benefits to it. I mean, you just will feel more alive and more vital. I mean, I thank you so much for uh, attending. PBNSG has a lot of resources, you know, you know, go on our website, come to our meetings. If we can help you in any way, uh, we're out to change the world. Right, Lisa? Oh, oh this, this is all I do. I'm going to be talking plants <laughs> in my sleep. I slang plants for right. a <laughs> and um, it's a beautiful thing. So thank you everybody for joining us. We look forward to seeing you back here next Wednesday. <laughs> As Paul will say, together as one, but I am not attaching a corny joke to it. I refuse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Bye, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Mm -hmm.